Okay, people, welcome back. So, I would like to start uh, this session with some interaction. National College, Tamil Nadu. How to check whether a decomposition is lossy or lossless joint decomposition? Okay, the question is how to check if a decomposition is lossy or lossless. So, um, I have stuff on that coming up, or um, unless somehow I lost the slide. So, the basic idea is that. Uh, before you decompose, you must make sure that certain functional dependencies hold. Or if we move to multi-value dependencies, you could have alternatively a multi-value dependency. Or in fact, there are some further generalizations called joint dependencies. So, the idea is that you take the original relation and check if uh, certain properties hold. If so, the decomposition is lossless. So, what are these properties? So, let me uh, use the whiteboard. The question was, uh, how do you know that a decomposition is lossless joint? So, the condition is if I have R being decomposed into R1, R2, what we want is the join of natural join of R1 and R2 ought to be equal to R. This is what we want. But how do we know this? Is there a sufficient condition which will ensure this? The con so, natural join obviously uh, depends on. Uh, what attributes are in common. So, let us take um, the intersection. So, these are uh, actually I am using the R1, R2 as schema and relation kind of loosely. So, if I want to be uh, more specific, um, I have to take uh, actual relations on this, but let us not worry too much about this. So, what I want is that the common attributes, what are the common attributes? R1 intersection, R2, those are the common attributes. So, there is a sufficient condition on the common attributes which ensures that the decomposition is lossless and that sufficient condition is that the common attributes either determine R1 or they functionally determine R2. One of these two uh, should be satisfied. If it is, then the decomposition of R into R1 and R2 will be lossless. That is when we do this join, it will give us back the original relation for any relation state which satisfies the functional dependency. All of this is based on a set of functional dependencies. So, if R satisfies the given functional dependencies based on which we uh, checked that the common attributes uh, functionally determine either all of R1 or all of R2, the join will be lossless. Uh, sorry, the decomposition will be lossless. Any follow up question? During normalization, we have to use the joins. If we are dealing with small database, there will not be any performance issues. Hmm. Now, my question is, will there be any performance issues if we make use of huge database? Okay. So, the question is, uh, if you normalize and break things up, then to get required information, you have to join things back to get at data. So, is there a performance implication, especially on large data? So, there are uh, two answers to this. First of all, uh, most applications that we build today are not actually stressing databases. Uh, so, uh, few extra IOs required to fetch uh, the uh, data from another relation is usually not a huge problem for most, in most situations. However, there can be certain situations um, like the quiz module yesterday misbehaving. I am not sure what the performance issue was. I need to uh, I need time to dig deeper, which I don't have during this workshop. Maybe I can uh, somebody uh, can take a look at it. Uh, but the point to note here is that the cost of doing the join is usually not atrocious. Yes, there is a price, but it's usually not a killer. So in the first cut, you would probably not worry about performance. You normalize in order to avoid redundancy. After all this, supposing you find that there is a performance a penalty somewhere and your system really needs to improve performance, um, what do you do? And a partial solution is that uh, you create denormalized relations. I will talk about it at the end of uh, today's session. I have a couple of slides on that. Okay. So, do not worry about the performance penalty at this point. Okay. Last question from National College. Go ahead. Sir, uh, is it possible for a trigger hmm. to update tables on remote server, sir? The question is, can I trigger update tables on remote servers? Now, this is a very database specific question. Um, so, some databases do not even allow updates on remote tables. Uh, 
but if it did, can a trigger do that? Uh, it would usually be a bad idea because triggers are uh, executed from uh, some other update and they are often executed as part of that update. So here is an update which you thought was very cheap, but because somebody defined a trigger on it, it turned into a remote update and a remote update is expensive because you have to communicate with the remote database. You have to ensure atomicity, which means you have to use a distributed commit protocol. Uh, so all that has a big penalty. So it's usually a bad idea to put something very expensive within a trigger because some unfortunate soul uh, gets uh, totally chewed up because you added a trigger. So my guess is uh, most databases would not support it. They would not allow something which can cause havoc. Um, but I don't know, maybe some databases do support it. But if your goal is to do something like this, there is an alternative mechanism. And this idea is that you use what are called persistent messages. Uh, what does this mean? The trigger will add a row in some table which records what has to be done at the remote site. Then you have a separate program which is running uh, maybe continuously, maybe periodically every five minutes, whatever. It checks this other table to see what all messages have been inserted and it will take that message and perform an uh, update on the remote center. And once the uh, update is performed, it will delete the message from this relation. So this is called persistent messaging. Let me use the whiteboard. So this is unrelated to normalization, but since you asked the question, okay, so the basic idea is for any uh, remote action, you simply log uh, in a local relation, you'll add a row, it's called a message, uh, which records what has to be done. And there's a separate process which is continuously reading this relation, taking uh, the things there and executing them at remote sites. And there are uh, tools which um, support this out of the box. You don't have to develop this on your own. Uh, so there are many uh, things. There's uh, MQ from IBM. There is uh, an open source. Uh, there's a Java version of this. Uh, I forget what. So there are tools for this also. Anyway, let's uh, get back to normalization now. So let's uh, take a question from some other center. Uh, MGM College Nandit, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, sir, can we have a relation between two weak entities and do we need to have a discriminator for that relation? Okay. So yesterday's uh, discussion, uh, we had, if you recall, uh, we said that uh, in the Moodle thing, course is a strong entity. Course is a strong entity. And then we said assignment is a weak entity set which is dependent on course. And then we said that a submission in turn is a weak entity set which is dependent on assignment. In fact, uh, we even had a version of it where submission was uh, dependent on uh, the user also, the user who submitted it. Okay, so we have um, actually two different cases, both which were shown in yesterday's example. The first was that you can have a weak entity set which is identified by another weak entity set assignment. Okay, so uh, the primary key for assignment would be its uh, discriminator along with the primary key of course. Now the primary key of submission, uh, forget the user, uh, let's say it was not identified by user, it's only identified by assignment. Then the primary key of assignment uh, of submission would be uh, its discriminator plus the uh, primary key of assignment which itself consists of the primary key of course, discriminator of assignment, discriminator of submission. So all these keys are combined to get its primary key. And we had a variant where submission is also um, dependent on user. Uh, so it's there's an identifying relationship from submission to assignment and submission to user. Uh, so it's a double level thing. And uh, then you, uh, it's in this particular case, it didn't even need a discriminant. So the primary key of assignment plus the primary key of user would become the primary key of submission. So yes, all these things are possible. They are not discussed in detail in the book, uh, but 
it can happen. Okay, let us move back to normalization. Uh, please, no more questions other than normalization because I want to finish this topic today. Okay, one of the questions is Is there any tool to find functional dependencies? Uh, that is an interesting question. The functional dependencies are supposed to be determined by the application that you are modeling. It is not supposed to be determined from the data. You should study your application and if the application domain says that a department has only one building, that is a functional dependency. Uh, you cannot just look at data and determine it. However, that said, uh, there are many people who look at large volumes of data and want to look for approximate functional dependencies, things which more or less hold in real data. If you want to say that, um, you know, most people uh, who satisfy these conditions also uh, all have this common thing. So, there has been work on finding such approximate functional dependencies on real data. It is actually related to data mining, uh, but that is unrelated to the database normalization process. Another question is, uh, actually many people have been asking related questions. One of the questions is on what basis uh, do we say uh, for a particular application that X normal form is enough? Which normal form industry supports? Uh, and many other people have asked similar questions. That is um, can be answered as follows. First of all, uh, first normal form is uh, pretty much standard, although uh, databases today including Postgres, uh, Oracle and so on allow um, certain kinds of structured attributes. So, Oracle supports arrays and sets which is not even first normal form, forget all the other normal forms. Uh, so, it, the databases allow you to do whatever you want. The question is what do people use in practice? Uh, so, first normal form is generally a minimum which people do use. Uh, beyond the second normal form as I said is not really relevant, it is too weak. Uh, it's, so, what people would use uh, would be one of 3NF or BCNF and then if you also include multi value dependencies uh, instead of uh, BCNF, 4NF is the extension of BCNF to multi value attributes. So, uh, what people do in practice is uh, BCNF or 3NF is ensured and then multi value dependencies are used for some further decomposition. So, we uh, you know 4NF is a target, although the uh, inference rules for multi value dependency are a little more complex. So, I do not know if people use it in practice, but at least informally uh, those ideas are used. Formally probably uh, 3NF or BCNF is what is done formally. Now, amongst BCNF and 3NF which do you choose? I will come back to this after uh, it is there some slides down. And the answer is uh, given what SQL databases support, uh, you know, BCNF is probably good enough. However, the 3NF algorithm decomposition algorithm uh, does tend to give you good schemas uh, which preserve dependencies. So, maybe that is a it is a good idea to use that algorithm. Uh, and then in certain cases, we may decompose further to bring it into BCNF, even if it uh, does not satisfy uh, 3NF, uh, sorry. If there is something which does not satisfy BCNF, even though it satisfies 3NF, we may decompose it further to bring it to BCNF. Okay, let us see what other questions. Is it possible that a relation has um, anomalies and it is still not possible to apply any normal form? Uh, and we are going to see that it depends on what normal form you choose, but uh, if you just consider functional dependencies, uh, you can have a relation. We will have an example coming up later which satisfies uh, all the um, uh, you know BCNF, 3NF trivially, but has redundancy, uh, and that is where 4NF comes in. Now, people then said, Hey, um, 4NF based on multi value dependency is great, but here are some more complex situations where there is redundancy, and that led to the notion of what is called joint dependency. Then people said, hey, joint dependency is still not enough. There is a, some more examples of redundancy. And that led to something uh, called uh, domain key normal form and so forth. But practically speaking, this became uh, too abstruse that for people to handle. So, in industry, people as far as I know stop with multi value dependency. Okay. So, let us uh, get back to the slides here. This is uh, where we were just before the break. So, here is a quiz for attribute closure. This is actually a very simple quiz. So, let me start it now. Just go over the solution here. Uh, attribute closure started with of A plus starts with A because B is there we get A B 
and uh, because uh, now B is uh, part of AB, we can also add CD. Uh, but now can we add anything more? The only other dependency is B goes to F. E is not in the closure, so we cannot uh, use that one. So the attribute closure is ABCD. Okay, so now what do we do with attribute closure? There are many uses for attribute closure. First of all, uh, we already saw how to use it to test for super key. To check if alpha is a super key, compute alpha plus, check if it contains all the attributes. In. We can also use it to test a functional dependency. Supposing we want to check if a functional dependency alpha determines beta holds, uh, it is very simple. Just compute alpha plus, which we saw how to compute. It is actually very, very cheap to compute alpha plus. It is a very efficient algorithm. F plus can be very large but uh, and take a long time to compute. But alpha plus can be computed extremely fast. So all we do is compute alpha plus and check if beta is a subset of or equal to alpha plus. If it is, then we know this dependency holds. Very simple. Now we can also use attribute closure to compute F plus. How do we do this? Well, basically we take every subset of R okay, and for every such subset we compute gamma plus, the closure of that the attribute closure and then for every S subset of or equal to gamma plus we have output a function dependency gamma goes to S. That is the closure of this because if you compute all of F plus there is a huge amount of redundancy. So we really do not want any algorithms in practice which computes all of F plus. It is very expensive, lot of unnecessary stuff there which will not be of any use at all. But if you wish to compute F plus this is how you could do it. Now that said, uh, many of our algorithms say that uh, check uh, something in F plus. So it is actually uh, seems like you have to compute F plus before you can check if something is in BCNF or 3NF and so forth. As it turns out, you do not really have to do that. Um, there are some shortcuts. Uh, complexity wise, the shortcuts uh, in some cases are much cheaper. In some cases, the worst case complexity is high, but in practice they are much faster. So we will see this and they are all based on attribute closure. But before we do that, uh, this slide probably should have come a little bit earlier. Lossless joint decomposition, I already explained this using the whiteboard and uh, this was this thing which we said that a decomposition of R into R1 and R2 is lossless join if at least one of these two holds. The common attributes determine R1 or they determine R2. And this notation is a more formal thing from what I said. I simply said R1 capital R1 join R2, but actually it should have been project on R1 of R join project on R2 of R. This is the correct way of viewing it. If you are decomposing the schema, then you decompose the relation to get pi R1 of R and pi R2 of R and the join of that should give us back R, then it is lossless. Now note that this is a sufficient condition, but it is not a necessary condition because there are situations where something called multi-value dependencies hold no functional dependencies hold, but still the decomposition is lossless join. Um, we have another example here, A, uh, B, C is the schema, two functional dependencies, A join, determines B, B determines C. There are two possible decompositions of this which are lossless join. The first is um, to take A, B, B, C. What is the common attribute here? B. And uh, if you take the schema uh, B C, because of this function B determines C, we can infer that B determines B C. In other words, the common attributes is a super key for one of these two schemas, R2 in this case. Uh, and if you do it the other way, we uh, decompose into A B and A C, that is the other alternative. This is also lossless uh, because in this case, the common attribute is A and because we have the functional dependency A determines B. It is clear that uh, A determines AB, in other words A is a super key of R1. In fact, you can also infer that A determines C, so A also happens to be a super key of R2. So this one is certainly lossless joint. Now here is something interesting. So uh, let us look at the last uh, bullet in this slide. It says that this second decomposition is not dependency preserving. So what does that mean? So there are uh, two dependencies, 
A determines B, B determines C. If you take the first decomposition into AB and BC, it is lossless join. And uh, furthermore, the dependency, uh, the functional dependency A goes to B can be checked on R1, and the functional dependency B goes to C can be checked on R2. But if you take the other decomposition, you can check A determines B on R1. On R2, you can check A determines C, but it is possible to create a state of the database uh, with R1 and R2, where B determines C is violated. Uh, how can you achieve this? Well, basically, uh, you can uh, let me use the whiteboard to show this. So, we have a decomposition um, into AB and AC, and the functional dependencies are A determines B, B determines C, and the other inferred one is A determines C. These are the non trivial ones. <laughs> now, with this particular decomposition, we can check A determines B, we can check A determines C. But what about B determinacy? Supposing I have uh, values here uh, A1, B1, and then I have another thing with A2, B1. Okay. Does this satisfy A determines B? Yes, because the A values are different. Uh, similarly, here I will have A1, C1. Uh, does this uh, satisfy uh, the functional? Well, uh, this is one tuple here. Uh, let me add a second tuple A2, C2. Uh, does this satisfy uh, the functional dependency A determines C? Yes, there is no two tuples of the same A value. But if I join these back, it is lossless join. Okay? So, whatever I started with, I will get back. Uh, so, what is the join result? A1, B1, C1, A2, B1, C2. Okay, this is the join result. And this is where I started with. I mean, you can easily check that. Uh, if this is where I would have started to get uh, this thing, and when I join it, I will get it back because the common attribute A function determines uh, is a super key for the first relation. But now the functional dependency B determines C has been violated. I cannot check it on this. I cannot check it on the second one either. I need to join these two to get this, and then I can see that ah, the functional dependency is violated. So, the uh, bottom line here is that if the decomposition is not dependency preserving, whatever I can check locally is not enough to ensure uh, at least one of the functional dependencies here B determines C. So, coming back, it is obvious that we should choose the first one because the, this one is dependency preserving. So, given a choice between this decomposition and this one, we would choose this one. Now, the next question is, is this in uh, BCNF? Um, and it is easy to see that this initial schema has a functional dependency B determines C, where B is not a super key. This dependency is not trivial and B is not a super key. A is a super key, but B is not. Therefore, it is not in BCNF and we have to decompose it. Both of these decompositions are in actually in BCNF, uh, but this first one is also dependency preserving, the second one is not dependency preserving. So, what we would like is to get a BCNF decomposition which is dependency preserving. Later, we are going to see this is not always possible. Uh, so, a couple of slides down. So, formally, uh, how do we know if something is a particular decomposition is dependency preserving? I kind of argued and showed you an example to show that it is not decomposing, uh, dependency preserving. But how can you show that it is dependency preserving? The answer is as follows. Um, at least uh, theoretically, it is an expensive test, but uh, formally, let us say that we compute F plus, that is the set of all functional dependencies implied by whatever is given initially. F is given, we compute F plus. Now, we are decomposing that given schema into R1, R2 and so on. So, let the let F i be the set of dependencies in F plus that include only attributes of R i. Okay, these are the ones which can be checked efficiently on R i. By just looking at R i, I can see if this functional dependency is satisfied or not. So, 
uh, what we can do now is each of the fi can be checked locally. Now we take the union of the fi's and then we compute the closure of that, what all is implied by that. If that closure is equal to f plus, then we can be sure that the decomposition is dependency preserving. If it is not, then something is, uh, some dependency cannot be checked locally and we have to do a join in order to check the dependency. So, how do you uh, check if a particular decomposition is dependency preserving? Uh, for lack of time, I would not get into it. Uh, you can obviously compute f plus, but you would die uh, generating all of f plus. There is a cleaner method using uh, attribute closure, which is there in the uh, book. It is not there in this set of slides, these are abbreviated, but if you look at the books, uh, textbooks website dbbook.com, uh, those slides are more complete and this is discussed. Okay. So, this one is uh, the same example we saw just a little bit back. Um, this particular decomposition is BCNF lossless joint dependency preserving. This is a good one, decomposing to ABBC. Now, let us uh, come back to how to check for BCNF. Now, this is something which uh, is a little tricky. Initially, if you are given a relation and a set of one relation and a set of functional dependencies on that relation, there is actually a simplified test for. BCNF. So, what is the basic test for BCNF? We should check every functional dependency in F plus, but F plus is huge. I do not want to compute F plus. So, the first question is if you are given an initial schema R and an ini a set of functional dependencies F on that schema, then it suffices to check only the relation uh, the functional dependencies in F for violation of BCNF. What do I mean by check these for violation? For each such functional dependency, we are going to uh, check if it is either trivial or it is a uh, the left hand side is a super key. We are only going to apply this test for things in F. We are not going to do it for any other things in F plus, only in F. And it turns out for the initial schema, this suffices. If none of the dependencies in F causes a violation, then none of the dependencies in F plus will cause a violation either. So, it is enough to check this, but then one might think that okay, now let us decompose the relation and again apply the same check on the decomposed relations and this example shows you that that does not actually work. Let us say f is a goes to b, b c goes to d, that is the dependencies you are given, r is this one a b c d. Now, it is clear that the very first function a determines b shows that this violates B C N F. Why? It is not trivial. Is A a super key? No. What is A plus? It is just A B. It is not a super key. Therefore, we must decompose and we decompose into A B and A C D E. Okay, I hope you understood this. I will repeat this. The basic idea of getting something into B C N F is to find a, a functional dependency that shows violation of B C N F and then decompose using that functional dependency. Now, decomposing using a functional dependency means what? Uh, if we decompose with a b, a, a determines b, one of the relations contains all the attributes of the functional dependency. The other relation contains the left hand side and all the remaining attributes of the original relation. So, in this case a and then the remaining attributes which is c d e, those are the two things. Now, the next step is Supposing we used the same f and checked r1 and r2. For r1, there is something interesting here. The interesting point to note is that any binary relation is automatically in BCNF. Okay, let me put this on the whiteboard to reiterate this point. Why? Because if it is a binary relation, there are only two attributes, let us say a and b. The only possible non trivial dependencies on this are A functionally determines B or B functionally determines A. These are the only two possible things. Now, if you take this dependency, uh, A plus is clearly A B, which means A is a super key. If you had this one, then similarly B would be a super key. Therefore, uh, either of these dependencies uh, would not violate BCNF. Therefore, any binary 
uh, relation at all is automatically in BCNF. We do not have to bother checking it further. It's guaranteed. Okay. So coming back, AB is already in BCNF. We won't bother. How about ACDE? Is it in BCNF? If we check the original set of functional dependencies, A goes to B. B is not even here, so we can't. Uh, it cannot violate anything. Uh, how about BC goes to D? Uh, B is not even an attribute here, so BC goes to D cannot show uh, violation of BCNF here. So you might think that R2 is in BCNF, but it's actually wrong. It's not. And the reason is, from these two, AB goes to D and uh, sorry, uh, A goes to B and BC goes to D. From these two, we can infer one more functional dependency, which is AC determines D. Okay, if you think about it. Uh, from A B, A determines B, I can infer A C goes to B C and using A C goes to B C, B C goes to D, I can infer A C goes to D. It is very easy. Or alternatively, if I start with R 2, I take A plus um, using this, I will actually let me come back to that method later, I will have it in a few slides. So the bottom line is A C goes to D can be inferred. And if you take AC goes to D and check this one, uh, is AC a super key? No. AC does not functionally determine E, therefore AC is not a super key. At the same time, it is not trivial, therefore R2 is not in BCNF. We have to decompose it further. What will we decompose R2 into? ACD and ACE. Okay. So let me just uh, do that on the whiteboard. A C D E was the schema and the functional dependency we had inferred was A C functionally determines D. Now if you use this to decompose, uh, we get A C D as one of the relations and the other relation has A C and the remaining attributes uh, other than D which is in this case E. Okay, so this is the decomposition. Now is this in B C N F? It is not binary, so there may be a violation. Uh, how do we check that? So we have to check if there is any dependency in F plus uh, which shows this violates it. Now again, that is uh, difficult to compute F plus. Uh, so there is a nice alternative which is coming up in a slide or two. So let's go back to the slides. So here is the simplified test. Okay. So what we can do is one of two alternatives. Uh, the formal alternative is you t test Ri each Ri with respect to the restriction of f to ri that is fi you know we saw that in the previous thing first compute f plus then take the subset which only contains attributes from ri what is ri by the way we have r we have decomposed into r1 r2 r3 up to rm so ri is one of the decomposed relations so either we can do this it's too expensive or this is a uh, in terms of uh, you know algorithmic complexity this is the same but in terms of human uh, difficulty it is much simpler. What we do is we do not compute F plus, but instead take every set of attributes alpha of subset of R and check that alpha plus, how do we compute closure of alpha plus with respect to the original functional dependency. We are not computing F plus, we are given F, we compute uh, closure of alpha under those things and we will make sure that alpha plus either includes no attributes of Ri minus alpha, uh, that is it only includes attributes of alpha and maybe some other attributes, not even in Ri, those do not matter. But if it includes any attribute of Ri other than alpha, it includes all attributes of alpha. Now why is this test useful? Uh, if this condition is violated by some um, alpha goes to beta in F, uh, F plus, this should be this should not be F, it should be if it is violated by something in F plus. Okay. So uh, then we can uh, show that uh, alpha determines this thing uh, that that is um, what, what do we have here? It has beta, alpha determines beta, alpha is not a super key. So it, since it is not a super key, alpha plus uh, minus alpha will have some attribute. Uh, 
intersection ri okay this is this is the functional dependency uh, which we can infer okay so what we have done is we have taken some set alpha we have verified that alpha plus is not ri therefore um, you know it's not a super key now what we can say is take this thing and it's a dependency which we can infer what is the dependency alpha plus minus alpha intersection ri this set of attributes you know we can show that alpha function determines this set and this one will show violation of bcnf because this will be non trivial and alpha is not a super key and we can use this thing to decompose ri okay, so that's a basic intuition so it will be a little more clear if we put it in practice um, given the same example before a determines b bc determines d and we have broken it so far into r1 and r2 on r2 we have to check uh, various uh, attribute pluses ideal we should check what all do we check every subset what are the subset a c d e a c c d d e e a a c d c d e and so forth we have to check all these combinations actually it turns out we don't have to uh, check combinations of three attributes because uh, any functional dependency involving them will become a um, uh, super key so that doesn't have to be checked so we only have to check a c d e individually and pairs of these but as it turns out the very first one we try a plus what is a plus it includes b um, and uh, a, this a goes to b b c goes to d is what we want uh, so it's not uh, a b c it's just a b mm, c is not even in here or we should take a c plus but in this case uh, just do a plus that's good enough so th this was a mistake in this slide I'll just so if we have uh, a c a plus is uh, a b i'm uh, sorry um, but that by itself is uh, what does it show a b is not even here that by itself is no use so what we should have uh, used is um, a c plus that is the one which we should have used a c plus is the one which actually shows violation so as i said we have to try all combinations a c plus closure what does it give us uh, a c plus will add b and because of b c it will add d a c plus is a b c d now since a c plus is a b c d uh, in this case b is not involved here so if you take the intersection with r i that is a c d e what we get is uh, a c determines uh, a c goes to d is the one which we had determined so given the original dependencies a goes to b b c goes to uh, d if, if i am not mistaken okay so those are the two dependencies so applying ac a plus is no use it doesn't show anything c plus is no use there is nothing in there um, in this case a plus is just ab uh, which is no use for this one similarly d plus is no use e plus is no use so all the single attribute closures don't show anything now if you take ac plus what do we get as i said we get abcd and from it if we intersect with ri ri uh, is this one r2 is this one so if we intersect with that what we get is ac goes to d we intersect and we also remove the attributes in the left hand side ac so what is the left is ac goes to d is the uh, functional dependency we infer uh, but uh, bottom line we don't actually have to infer that initially what we do is we compute ac plus and it includes abcd which has an attribute other than ac i mean b can be eliminated because it's not in ri forget about b among the attributes in ri it has an attribute d which is not in ac and at the same time there is an attribute e which is missing so ac plus is not a super ac is not a super key for r2 and uh, we infer that bcnf is violated and to know which functional dependency violates it um, the slide showed how to infer this in our example we can infer ac goes to d is the functional dependency that violates bcn coming back here uh, assume that this slide is corrected 
and uh, th this is how we this particular line here is how we inferred AC goes to D is the one which is violating BCNF. This computation here. Okay, so uh, that uh, now brings us to the overall BCNF decomposition algorithm. Uh, we have shown how to check uh, for violations. Now what we do is start with the initial schema being just uh, containing only one relation R, which is all the uh, we are just given one relation. The initial result contains that schema. Uh, the decomposition algorithm as shown here computes F plus, but as I said, we do not have to do that. There are shortcuts. Now what we say is, if there is a schema Ri that is not in BCNF, initially for R we can just check the um, functional dependencies in F. If one of them shows a violation of BCNF, we decompose. If none of them shows violation of decomposition we are, uh, of BCNF, we are done. If one of them shows violation, we break it into um, we, we take result, remove the set Ri from it. Result is a set of schemas. We remove Ri from that set of schemas and we add back two different schemas. One of the schemas is alpha beta, that is this dependency. The other schema is Ri minus beta. Okay? Uh, there is an extra condition alpha intersection beta is empty set uh, that uh, you know removes the need in, in one of the earlier slides. Um, we had said alpha, uh, not not this one. Somewhere earlier, uh, we had worried about things which are common on both sides. Our earlier uh, decomposition thing worried about attributes which are on both sides of the functional dependency. Here we are simplifying our life by ignoring functional dependencies which have an attribute on both sides. We can simplify those by removing that attribute and only consider these dependencies. So then uh, we add alpha beta and Ri minus beta. So this decomposition is lossless, it is very easy to show. The common attribute is alpha and uh, it is a super key of this relation. Uh, so it is easy to see it is lossless and if uh, at the end of this loop uh, nothing changes, it is very easy to show that this thing is in BCNF. There are no more uh, functional dependencies that show violation and we are done. So of course, how the question is instead of computing F plus um, and then looking for alpha goes to beta and F plus, we take a schema Ri and do attribute closure on each subset of its attribute and check this. So that is an easy way of doing it. So here is an example, mm, it is the same example as before um, and here we see that B determines C shows that it is not in BCNF because B is not a super key. So we decompose into BC and the remaining is AB. So this particular decomposition is now in BCNF, everything is binary and we are done. Uh, there is another alternative. We could have even, uh, uh, well, in this case, uh, we could have decomposed it on A goes to B and turned it into A, B, A, C. That is not required uh, from the viewpoint of BCNF decomposition because A is a super key. So this is not violating BCNF. But if we chose to decompose it that way, we would get a different decomposition, which is in BCNF in the end. Okay. So here is a quiz question. Given this relation and the functional dependency A goes to C, D, the BCNF decomposition is which of these? It is a simple question. So this is actually a very easy question. So if you take A goes to CD, obviously one of the relations has to be ACD. The other relation basically removes the attribute CD from the original relation, which gives us AB. So the answer is AB and ACD. Okay, people have been asking for examples of BCNF. We did a toy example. People asked for a live example. I think this is what they meant by a live example using you know, things which are identifiable as meaningful uh, relations. So here is a relation class which is kind of artificially created by uh, joining together many of our tables. But if we started with a universal relation, maybe we would land up with this situation at some point. What all is in there? Course ID, title, department name, credits. These are the ones from course. And then section ID, semester, year, building room number. All of these come from section. 
Okay. So, section has course ID, section ID, semester year, building and room number and time slot ID. And in addition, building and room number uh, have a capacity which comes from the classroom relation. So, this is really a join of course, section uh, and classroom, three relations which have been joined together. And we want to see uh, if this is in BCNF and if not do the decomposition. So, what are the functional dependencies which we have here? Um, in our model, course ID functionally determines title, department name and credits. This is actually fairly reasonable, uh, ignoring uh, temporal aspects, uh, because across uh, several years, the same course ID may be reused. But at a point in time, course ID does determine the title of the course, department and credits. Now, room numbers are unique only within a building. So, building comma room number identifies a room uniquely, which means the capacity, room cannot have two capacities. So, building comma room number determines capacity. Um, the last one says, um, a particular section must meet in only one room at one time slot. So, the section is identified by course ID, section ID, semester year. It must meet in only one classroom, therefore, building room number are determined. And moreover, it must meet only in one time slot, so time slot ID is determined. So, these are the functional dependencies we have. So, if we had not started from the decomposed relation, we started from this and our understanding of the domain, we would have come up with these functional dependencies. Now, we uh, see if these functional dependencies are satisfied, um, sorry, uh, cost violation of BCNF and then decompose. So, uh, this it turns out does have a candidate key, which is course ID, section ID, semester year, because section uh, uniquely identifies course and also uniquely identifies classroom. So, the key of section is actually a super key of this joint relation. But uh, there are other functional dependencies which violate BCNF. In particular, um, once we have course ID, we know that all the details of the course are functionally determined. So, we have this one, the first functional dependency, where course ID is not a super key. So, if there are two sections of the same course, all of these are going to get repeated. That is the intuition. Therefore, we decompose using this functional dependency to get what? Course with course ID, title, department, name, credits. That is our usual course relation. And the remaining ones after deleting title, department, name, credits. So, if you remove these three, what is left? Course ID, section ID and all of these. So, that is, let us call it class 1. Is this in BCNF? We will have to check. Uh, let us look here. Building comma room number determines capacity. Now, that is a uh, functional dependency which holds here, but is building room number a super key of this? No, it is not. Therefore, we need to decompose. Okay. So, using this, we replace class 1 by a classroom which is building room number capacity. This was the original classroom relation. And what is left? If you remove um, capacity from here, remove capacity from here, what is left is the four things which are a super key of section along with um, building room number and time slot ID. And that is exactly this. That is the section relation. So, what we have got now is a decomposed relation which is in BCNF. Now, how are we sure? Well, we do actually have to apply the test further here on this relation. Uh, is there something which violates it? As it turns out, uh, you know, you can verify that there is nothing more and we are done. So, that is a good example of BCNF decomposition on a realistic example. So, now let us see what, so BCNF is very good. There is one uh, minor drawback though, which is that sometimes you cannot get a dependency preserving BCNF decomposition. So, here is an example. Uh, there are three attributes J, K, L. I will give you a more realistic meaning for this, but let us keep it simple here to understand what is going on. Let us say there are two functional dependencies. J, K determines L, L determines K. Okay, that is what we are given. Uh, is R in BCNF? It is not. If you see L determines K, L is not a super key. This is not in BCNF. So, if we decompose this, what do we get? L K is one relation, L J is the other. 
Now, that is only decomposition possible here. So, it is clear that any decomposition of R will not preserve J k determines L. You can easily check that uh, the decomposed relations are binary and the dependencies there will not let us infer J k determines L. So, this will not be preserved by the decomposition. Okay. So, testing it will require a join in other words. So, what this example shows is there are relations which do not have any dependency preserving decomposition into DCN, BCNF. So, what do we do? We can say that dependency preservation is not so important, forget about it, let us stick with BCNF. That is a perfectly valid thing and we are most welcome to do it. But some people might say, hey, dependency preservation is important because if we do not, uh, if we cannot check it efficiently, we might land up with an inconsistent database. Uh, so, then what do we do? So, the answer is if dependency preservation is more important than the potential for duplication, uh, then uh, keep this schema unchanged, JKL as is. Now, it, you can check this dependency. Um, there is a violation of BCNF, um, but on this relation, perhaps you can have some other way of ensuring the functional dependency L goes to K. So, you can check, you can make sure that. Uh, there is no uh, duplicate. So, if L occurs twice, it will be the same k value. Okay. Assuming you have a mechanism in the database of ensuring functional dependencies, uh, keeping it as j k L and enforcing both these functional dependencies will keep it consistent. It is redundant, but it will be consistent. So, that was the intuition and going from this example, uh, more generally, uh, the question was can you uh, have some weakening of BCNF which allows uh, dependency preservation. And this led to another weaker normal form called the third normal form. And what does third normal form do? It allows some redundancy, but it ensures that we can always get a dependency preserving decomposition into third normal form. Now, there is some interesting history to third normal form. Third normal form was defined uh, by Cord and somebody else in a somewhat different way. The connection to uh, BCNF was not that clear, although uh, BCNF itself was also by Cord, Boyce Cord normal form. All of this was done by Cord. But later people said, hey, maybe you should interpret 3NF slightly differently, define it slightly differently, uh, which uh, is a little more clear, and that is the version that we are using. So, our version of uh, the 3 NF definition takes the BC NF definition and adds one more condition there saying uh, if both of these are violated as long as at least the third one is condition is satisfied it is ok. And what is the third condition? That for this functional dependency, okay, let me start from the beginning. The schema is in third NF if for all alpha determines beta NF plus at least one of these holds, either it is trivial or it is a super key. So far, it is BCNF or every each attribute in beta minus alpha. So, uh, is contained in a candidate key for R. And again, I will stress that each one may be in a different candidate key. They do not all have to be in the same candidate key. So, it is clear that if a relation is, BC, is in BCNF, it is automatically in 3NF because one of these two conditions is satisfied. We do not even have to test the third condition. However, something may be in third normal form, but not in BCNF because it may fail these two, but satisfy the third one. So, the third condition is in some sense a minimal relaxation of BCNF, which ensures that we can get a dependency preserving decomposition. So, let us uh, take an example, which is a little more realistic. So, actually kind of similar to the earlier example, but we have just given names. So, we have a department advisor now, not just advisor, a department advisor. So, for each student, a student may be associated with two departments. Why? Uh, maybe there is a double major that is common in the US. Uh, in IIT Bombay, we have a minor. There is no advisor for a minor, but uh, that might actually be a good idea. Someday we may introduce that. Uh, so, a student in computer science who minors in let us say um, mathematics 
could have one advisor in the CS department and one advisor in the maths department. What we want is to ensure that a student cannot have two advisors in the department. So, what we will say is that student ID and department name functionally determines the instructor ID. So, a student cannot have two advisors in the same department. But at the same time, we know uh, we uh, you know we know that the instructor must be in a department, instructor cannot be in two departments. So, we also have this functional dependency IID goes to instructor ID goes to department name. Now, if you see uh, this one SID IID department name and go back to the previous slide not this one, one more back. We said JKL, JK determines L, L determines K. If you see it is actually uh, almost isomorphic to this. Uh, J k determines L and uh, L determines K that is the same structure, it is identical to the other one. And if you see here um, R is not in B C N F, we already know that. This dependency I I D determines de department name shows that it violates B C N F, why? Because I I D is not a super key, there may be many tuples in here with the same I instructor. So, it is not a super key, but now the claim is that R is in 3 NF. How do we uh, check this? Uh, we are going to check the uh, functional uh, dependencies. Uh, so, here um, what do we have? We have uh, SID department name, this one SID department name determines IID. There is some slight um, mix here. Uh, this line break has come at the wrong place. Okay. What should have happened is uh, SID here should have been on the next line. It should have been SID, comma department name is a super key. So, please note this correction. I will uh, update it in the main slide. So, SID, comma department name is a super key. Therefore, it satisfies the second condition of BCNF. So, this uh, key is ok, uh, this functional dependency is ok. How about this functional dependency, IID goes to department name, it certainly violates BCNF. The question is does it satisfy the third condition of 3 NF, what is the third condition? Each attribute A in beta minus alpha that is each attribute on the right hand side must be in a candidate key. So, going back here, um, what is the right hand side uh, for this one? department name. Now, is department name in a candidate key? Yes, SID comma department is a candidate key. Why? You know first it is a super key right, it is clear that SID comma department name is a super key trivial. Is it a candidate key? Supposing we drop department, is uh, SID uh, super key? It is not because for different departments the student may have different advisors, so there may be two rows. Department by itself is also obviously not a super key. So, SID comma department name is a candidate key, it is minimal. And the right hand side of this dependency, uh, the only attribute here is present in the candidate key. Therefore, this last condition of 3 NF is satisfied. So, the argument is that this guy is fine, it is in 3 NF, we are done. As we saw, there is redundancy, things can get replicated. In fact, there is another problem um, which is a little more complex. Supposing we wanted to, uh, we use this schema and we also want to track which department each instructor is in. What are the alternatives? One alternative is to use this schema itself for instructors and if a instructor does not have an advisor, we put null for the um, student. ID. That is a particular instructor is not an advisor, there is no student that he is advising. So, we are in order to store that information in this table, we will have to have a null value for student ID. We can have the instructor and the department here, but null for uh, student ID. And if the same instructor is uh, uh, advisor for many uh, different students, uh, that instructor will appear many times. Um, and every time it has to appear with the same department, there is redundancy. So, uh, 
clearly there are two problems, there is redundancy and then some information cannot be represented without null value. It is also a little uh, weird to not store instructor department links separately, but to uh, merge it into instructor student ID. There is actually a third alternative which causes another set of problems. Let me use the whiteboard. So, what did we have? We had J K L or in our terminology student ID, I ID, instructor ID and department name. And we said we will not decompose this, this is in 3NS. So, now we are unable to record which department an instructor is in without putting it in this table, it is unnatural. So, I would say okay, let this table be there, let us also have an instructor ID comma department name as a separate table. So, for every instructor we will store the department name in this table and uh, for every student department pair we will store the instructor ID in this table. By the way, this is uh, uh, eminently possible from an ER uh, perspective. So, for every instructor there is a department name, it is there in our schema. Now, we may also have um, student advisor uh, department combination. So, earlier advisor was a relationship between student and instructor. Now, uh, if we did the ER diagram, let us say student, instructor, department and advisor would be a ternary relationship between, uh, so this one is called department advisor, I will call it DA, short for department advisor, is a ternary relationship between uh, student, instructor and department. So, uh, we have two separate things, instructor and department, there is also another relationship between these two. So, now what is the schema which we land up with? If we turn it to relations, uh, we have this one corresponding to the instructor relationship department, uh, sorry instructor department relationship, I am flipping it. And this one which is the department advisor between student, instructor and department is this one. So, let us call this instructor department, ID is this one and department advisor is that one. So, we have uh, two tables. So, we did a perfectly nice ER design, but here we are in a situation where it is not in BCNS. Okay, so, some people have been asking me, uh, if you do something with ER modeling, is it guaranteed to uh, be in a good normal form and we can do nothing further. But here, uh, we did go through all the steps, but we still have something which is not really in, uh, even in BCNS. Um, so, if you decompose it, uh, what do you do? To, if you want to decompose this, you will land up with a relation SID, IID. Okay. So, these two relations are actually enough uh, from the viewpoint of uh, representing uh, which all people are uh, um, advisors of the student. And the department can be inferred from the other chain. So, instead of associating with the department here, you can infer it through this indirect link. So, um, yeah, so the bottom line here is we did a perfectly uh, reasonable ER design and uh, landed up with something which violated BCNS and we could decompose it and store these two relations here, which are um, instructor department, student instructor. Now, on with this schema, it is very difficult to enforce that a student has at most one instructor per department. In order to do that, uh, we would have to do a join of these two and then check the functional dependency there. So, uh, one option is to avoid redundancy and do this. The other option is to keep these two relations, the first two relations. Here we run a different risk. Here we run the risk that uh, the instructor in the first case, in this relation, an instructor may be listed as being in computer science, but in this other relation, the same instructor may be listed as EE. There is no check across relations. Within each relation, you can ensure the functional dependency, but there is no way to check this across relations. So, this also is a problem. Incidentally, this kind of decomposition uh, 
you know may it may appear you would not land up with um, using BCNF decomposition. But if you did a 3 NF synthesis algorithm, it is actually possible to land up with uh, even with BCNF decomposition. I think there are some cases where you can land up with replication across relations. The same attribute is there in more than one relation and there is a problem uh, because of that. Um, so, you have redundancy across relations. So, what is the moral of this story? It is all very, very confusing. Should you do uh, 3 NF? Should you do BCNF? It is confusing. Um, so, I would say you know do not lose sleep over it. In particular, one of the reasons not to lose sleep is uh, thanks to S the SQL standard. We can supposedly take this schema and verify L goes to K on this efficiently. Okay. So, the assumption is that it is efficient because there is no join. We can easily check that L determines K on this schema. In fact, SQL offers no such support. SQL does not have any notion of uh, functional dependency as an integrity constraint. The only things it supports are primary key and unique which are both super key constraints. So, SQL offers no way of uh, checking that L functionally determines K. So, even if you did 3 NF and kept this within this relation itself, there is no way to enforce uh, the functional dependency L determines K. So, after all that effort, uh, you know, you go to SQL and SQL says, uh -uh, I will not enforce it for you. So, what is the point of dependency preservation when you cannot even enforce it? Uh, and if you kept this uh, other design where we had a uh, separate relation with instructor ID department name, then there is uh, repetition across relations which also can lead to problems. So, bottom line maybe BCNF is good enough uh, given that SQL anyway does not support uh, dependence, functional dependency checking properly other than super keys.